Maybe. It's a traveling time. <laughs> okay, I think we are online. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to conference call number nine. Tonight we are here with Brudy Frigo from Bordeaux. So we give a warm welcome to Hussein and Benjamin. They tune Hi. us from Bordeaux. And also Sam Bosch tuning in from Paris. Who we can't see right now. And Nicholas, our London correspondent, <laughs> always online. Uh, where is Sam? Huh? Sam. <laughs> uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Hi, Sam. Nice. Okay, can so you do that again? Sam, can you do that again? Nobody saw it. <laughs> <laughs> you have to make noise. Uh, <laughs> Okay, and we have uh, Sam Bosch. Also, warm welcome to Paris. Woo! Sam? <laughs> hey! Woo! Woo! What's that noise? <laughs> That's a fridge noise. All right. Okay. We're going to start now with the first question. Can I have the first question, please? Actually, we need it here. The first question is, what is Brie de Frigo? Can you tell us how did it all start, how you're organized, how many are you, and is there a meaning behind your name? <laughs> or just talk about yourselves. Yeah, uh, I'm ready to give the oldest part. Yeah, actually, Brie de Frigo is already quite old. Uh, it started with uh, students of architecture and arts that were questioning uh, why in the projects uh, that are made for the people that will live in the buildings or in the public space, uh, the, the ideas uh, wasn't asked and uh, why it was never a question in the project. So they started to do like uh, informal projects together and uh, I think officially it started 1997 and uh, yeah, Osin was uh, part of uh, the first members that started this uh, uh, collective. And it started off with uh, five persons, three were students in architecture, uh, another member was uh, a psychologist and uh, another person was from a more of a sociological profile. And as uh, Ben was saying, uh, the majority of the people were still students, still struggling with their studies, and uh, were asking questions about how you could implement architectural solutions where you could uh, bring in people for a kind of collaborative approach to design. And uh, as uh, Ben was saying earlier, on. and so that makes it to the 2000, uh, 1997. That's yeah, nearly 18 years old now. Can we ask where the name come from? <laughs> where did it come from? Yeah, the name was uh, actually they didn't expect that uh, it will uh, last that long, and uh, there was a bar in Bordeaux called Bruit du Frigo, okay. and then they did uh, one of the I think the first uh, exhibition they did uh, in Lebanon was in a cold room, like in a big fridge, freezer, uh, in a big freezer. And uh, so they called it Bruit du Frigo as the bar where they always met. Mm -hmm. And uh, afterwards, when they created the collective, it was uh, the name stuck. Yeah, mm -hmm. they they took the name because the bar wasn't existing anymore. And uh, but I think there was a whole idea that the name would be irrelevant to yeah. <laughs> what it was. So there was always an element of surprise where people would. We did have a few phone calls over the years where people would phone in to have their fridges repaired. Uh, saying that it was, it was Brudu Frigo means noise of the fridge. Yeah. So we even had a phone call one day where somebody phoned and said, I have a noise coming from my fridge. Can you repair my fridge? So it was really used to be to have nothing to do with what we were actually doing at the time. Do you want to ask the next question? Um, yeah, the next question maybe goes in a direction of, so 
have there, when you started with Brut de Frigo, have there been any references for you? Or was, it, was it, I mean, since you said you just started it quite early, like, um, what was the motivation kind of to start in 1997? Uh, I'd be probably speaking about the very old sites, and Ben would be speaking about the younger ones. So, um, I think at the time, even though we had the internet, uh, the, the, the main person that was really preoccupied with these questions of putting uh, the human and people at the center of the design process was Gabi Farage, who unfortunately died three years ago. And uh, he was the main person with the ideas behind this whole project. And then myself and uh, Yvon Detras, who was the current director of Rue du Frigo, kind of moved in with him and worked on these ideas. So the references at the time, though they existed, we didn't have access. We couldn't Google things very easily and uh, come across all sorts of pictures or uh, references about other collectives in the world. Uh, I even remember a sentence uh, of Gabby at once saying, uh, I'm sure there are lots of collectives all over the world that are doing the same things that we are doing, but we have no way of being in touch with them. So uh, It sounds like I'm speaking of someone who was 40 or 50 years ago. It was only these 18 or nearly 20 years ago. And the, so the references we had here in France, some of them came from the teaching we had in school because through a, a teacher we had who had uh, studied in America, she came over with these ideas of advocacy planning, which was a movement very strong in the 60s. And uh, amongst the references we had, though the, these are the works, we had the works of Jane Jacobs uh, and uh, also um, Henri Lefebvre in France with a very well-known uh, book here, which is called Le Droit à la Ville. So we had these theoretical references, yeah, and then yeah, Gabi yeah. Farage was very into uh, contemporary art scenes and uh, working with schools. So we kind of mixed all these, combined these things together, and it was a project in progress. We didn't have very set ideas at the time, but then it kept on moving. And, uh, yeah, and I think uh, uh, what Yvonne Detras told me is like. Uh, Arpenteur, which is a collective for, uh, from uh, Grenoble, was also one of the uh, big influences. Actually, they are not into construction, but uh, more into uh, mediation. mediation and giving a speech to the people and trying to uh, find some people with projects uh, and put them together to, to create some small projects. And uh, this was a big influence, I guess. And uh, uh, I'll add to what Ben was saying, uh, at the core of all of this has always been the idea that people should be uh, helped to become active uh, actors of the transformation of uh, their environment, the built environment. And uh, Pierre May in Arpenteur was uh, actually, uh, yeah, now that you say it, was the only one we knew of at the time and was a very strong influence as it is. Thank you. I think you're already answering the next question, which is about the politics behind your work. Um, but we were looking at your website, and we noticed you have some manifestos. One was about walking, and you mentioned Lefebvre already, but maybe you can tell us a little bit about your manifestos that you have as well. Uh, yeah, about the, the walking. Actually, it's uh, uh, by walking, you, you get a different scale of the spaces, and you can get to to places you would never go uh, by car, and uh, it's a sort of, uh, or for me, it's a sort of uh, lecture key of the city to discover some places of the city that, uh, to, to measure the scale, the, the building of the city, how it works in a different way, actually. So, uh, yeah, this is one of the projects uh, where Twice a year, uh, we, we make urban hiking, and we cross uh, uh, the peripherics of the city. We uh, go through uh, suburbia. suburbia, and uh, uh, it's linked to the project of uh, Les Refuges Périurbains, which are like uh, mountain refuges uh, where you can sleep uh, for one night for free. It's uh, quite simple. There's no water, no electricity. It's uh, just to discover something near to your uh, your home. Uh, yeah. 
maybe what are the, um, uh, the, 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 the projects uh, Ben is talking about uh, with these uh, urban hikings and that bring people to explore the, the outskirts of the city and uh, not only the suburbia, but also discover parts of the city they would never dwell in. Um, it also derives from uh, Yvonne's uh, personal leaving project when he was leaving school here in Bordeaux where he asked a question that sounded a bit, for us, sounded a bit crazy at the time, where he was asking what type of public space uh, could you imagine in um, suburban uh, areas, considering that you could not imagine conventional forms of public space in, the, in, in, in those areas. And he, for nearly one year and a half, what he did is, that's kind of the ancestor of this uh, uh, hiking uh, process. He, he, he dwelled, he walked around uh, the suburbia around Bordeaux, uh, miles and miles, and he registered different spaces on maps. So it was uh, one of the first uh, works of mapping that were made around Bordeaux at the time, uh, using very simple and basic ways of this work. And, uh, and then he questioned, the idea was, um, how could we make people in the city center aware of the potential of these emerging spaces in suburbia, spaces that were left uh, out by the highway, uh, that you had this kind of mosaic of spaces that were not used and that had very strong uh, landscape and social potential. And uh, so this kind of moved on to an idea that was the easiest way to bring people into these spaces using very little uh, budget would be to bring them uh, on leisure time, walking and hiking, and uh, then so these spaces go into the mental maps that they have of their city, and uh, gradually this moved on to being something that became institutionalized, which is something very rare where the, the, the local government uh, who's working on uh, preserving uh, green natural spaces and um, these two approaches of the, the, the territory met and uh, they, uh, they agreed after lots of discussions with Guido Frigo they agreed that they would have this network of uh, uh, hiking uh, paths around Bordeaux and then I let Ben talk about how this moved on to what he called the refuge periurbain, which are the same idea as cabins that you would find in the mountains, you know, where you can take refuge when uh, there's a storm or something. But they were to be thought of as the same thing, but at, a, at an urban scale and as a further way of staying in these new spaces. I'll let me maybe add something to that. Yeah, I don't know if it's the, the topic right now, maybe. <laughs> Uh, yeah, just quickly about this uh, refuge, so they are still there all around and in Bordeaux and people can rent them through a renting system and spend a night there? Yeah, actually it's uh, right now I think we have six uh, built and uh, four more to come and it's all around the city actually so uh, uh, the idea is at the end you can uh, walk for one day from one uh, shelter to the next one and uh, yeah it's a service of the the municipality so you can uh, everybody can for free uh, make like uh, vacations right next to their homes and also discover some spaces between nature and and city yeah so now there's a system uh, on the internet where you can uh, rent, uh, rent. Yeah, um, you can reserve for one night, uh, one shelter. Sam, do you want to add anything? <laughs> no, no, it's okay there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Go back to your fridge. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just five minutes and then I go because I'm cold. <laughs> no, but I think the, the shelters are, are closed during winter, isn't it, no? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's it. <laughs> so yeah. So, but these shelters. So peop, But you get you get feedbacks from people staying there, sleeping there, etc. 
uh, actually they are always full. It's like uh, you can, the first of each month, month you can uh, uh, reserve for the next month. And it starts at 9 o'clock. At 9.15 it's full. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, people uh, really use them a lot. Uh, and yeah, actually we got good feedback. Uh, the most people come from Bordeaux or surroundings, but we also have some people from uh, other cities or abroad yeah, that uh, come and use them. There's been a kind of survey where they try to, with statistics, to, to know where people came from. And one of the surprises was to discover that it was normally the, um, the movement of the population is from the periphery to the center. And with these reviews, uh, these they discovered that people tend to move from a, from suburbia to suburbia, discovering one landscape and another one, which is one of the, the things that were kind of expected for, but we're not sure of. So that was a nice good surprise. Okay. And you look here as well because you look at. Uh, <laughs> uh, so maybe we go to the next question, and this goes out to Sam. Because it's it's about the role of the public in your projects. Because we know you're often involved in the projects in the construction and realization phase. So can you maybe, from your point of view, um, tell us something about this? Sam yes, Walsh. of course. Yeah, because uh, the thing is that when when I met uh, Frigo the first time, it was in Nantes. And, uh, they were they were um, doing a kind of restaurant in a building. I think it was uh, at least ten floors. And this uh, project was with a lot of people from the corners. And, uh, and this was super uh, surprising because I, I used to work before in a kind of not with so much people. And when I arrived, do you hear me or? Yes. Yes, we hear you. Yeah. Yes. Then when I arrived in Nantes, it was with a lot of people, and of course, working with people in a corner, it's from children to grandmother and grandfather, so it's always something difficult. Or, and of course, it's something with uh, it's magical because, of course, you it's a lot of sub. And uh, the thing is that, as I, as I said, it's uh, something that if we, I know, no, I know that Brie Frigo take time to to do something in a corner, and, and this makes the difference between uh, an event, because if you are in the place during two, three weeks, three months, let's say sometimes we we with Brie Frigo at one year. It's completely different when you act and when you start to build something be because people know you. And I, uh, it's what I like with Brody Frigo. It's when I arrived as a builder, all the network is here. People knows, people know Brody Frigo. People know to or to react about this kind of uh, action in a public space. And this project, and we then, just uh, yes. No, I maybe, I, maybe I can add. Uh, I I think uh, uh, many projects is like a, a frame actually uh, that we build, and we try to imply the people to uh, to fill this frame. So uh, takes a lot of time, but uh, uh, a big part of the content is what is already happening in the quarters, but uh, it becomes visible and. Uh, uh, because of becoming visible, the people are really uh, uh, giving their best for for the the project, and uh, it's uh, yeah we we build the frame, and the people are filling it with the, the usage with the projects. So yeah, it depends on the project actually. But, uh, I think that's a good segue to our next question. Can you? Um, the question is, how much have you already decided in advance what the outcome of your project will look like, and how much of it is left up to your interactions with the people you're working with? Uh, or how rigid is the projected outcome of your work? 
there's maybe something that needs to be pointed out to answer that question is that uh, very often the projects have um, of an ephemeral uh, status. You will see photographs where you see actual microarchitectures, but these architectures are mainly used as third spaces, as Ben was saying. They're a framework, and people come in there, and they suddenly have this kind of house for all or something where things come together. There's a cultural program. There is interaction workshops in or outside. And the, the architecture itself, if we're talking design or architecture, is inspired by the sense of place, by probably all the networking that was done before, but it's maybe not the same issues as if we were we were asked to produce uh, a long-lasting uh, architecture working with the people. Uh, I don't know if you see what I'm trying to get yeah, to. Yeah. I, yeah, actually, it depends on the pro projects again. Uh, one project we had uh, in the quarter in Bordeaux called La Bounouge. Uh we did the first project, which was uh, to gather information to build afterwards a, a structure that should stay in the quarter. And this was more uh, designed with the people. We did uh, different workshops. Uh, it was the project uh, Loring. And uh, it was an idea battle. And so we did different uh, rings where people gave the ideas and then we tried to make a design with this and then we came back and from this uh, people tried to rearrange it and so we had different uh, uh, steps uh, uh, until the, the design and the final design that actually was never <laughs> built but this is uh, another story. <laughs> How long was the process from beginning to end more or less? Uh, this project, it was uh, almost four years because at the beginning we we came in this quarter because uh, we knew the city wanted to remake the, the park and uh, finally after two years we gathered a lot of ideas and we tested uh, a lot of usage and uh, then the, the mayor asked us to make a new project to really gather information for uh, a concrete project to make a, a sculptural structure that can be used uh, in different ways uh, depending on what the, the inhabitants would like. So this was a, actually a really long project. I don't remember if um, a question uh, uh, the outcome of having a permanent project was that in the game from the beginning or did that no it involved. Yeah. The two first years uh, we did with subventions we got and this was, uh, we, we hoped actually that the city will take care of the, what we, the ideas that we gather from the inhabitants, that they will uh, reuse them in some way for the future park project and uh, this was what was seeming to, to happen but uh, finally uh, in the end uh, it stopped. Okay, two good reasons. <laughs> so to a certain extent, these processes, long-lasting processes that will take two to three to four years are mainly to create a corpus that will uh, uh, create a kind of intelligence of that territory that we're working on, or neighborhood, that can be used by other architects or politicians or uh, anybody that's going to work in that neighborhood and that is normally basing himself on uh, a different type of information. Uh, this information is more a bottom-up uh, source of information that we kind of bring up uh, to people who are, on the other hand, probably working on a, a big master plan or something. And so as um, Ben was saying, uh, the outcome that they asked us at the end to, to produce uh, an open space that unf unfortunately didn't come to a, a good end uh, is something that appeared during the process towards the end of the process. Okay. Um, we have this next question that, that asks you how, how you pay your bills. And maybe, Very rude. maybe in this it's context close. you can <laughs> give us a quick overview on how are you organized. Like, um, also the question, if you, call you if you call yourself a collective or uh, if you are 
an association or what kind of company you are, where you're situated, like how your office might look like and how you're structured. We know you are like this Fabrique Polar has a is something has a meaning for you, so maybe you can give us an overview on this. And we can also maybe tie it in with the next question, which is about interns. And so if you have those and how they are also paid, if they are paid. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, actually, uh, we are five uh, people that are unemployed uh, full time at Brudy Frigo, but we work a lot with different people uh, uh, regularly with uh, Sam, with Austin, uh, and Cecile, a lot of people that. Uh, we we always work with, but uh, that are not permanent. Uh, so it's quite difficult, actually, to say uh, how many people we are. Uh, and uh, then, yeah, we have the base five people, no? Huh? But the base, the base yeah, of the base. The is, is for now because it's always moving. It's around five people, and they work in uh, La Fabrique Polar, no? Yeah, and uh, yeah, Fabrique Pola is uh, actually a, a, a federation of different uh, associations and uh, artists uh, with the idea of uh, putting in common uh, knowledge and tools and spaces for around the uh, cultural projects. Yeah. So it's, uh, I think we are about 80 people or something. In Pula, in the same space. And 80, 80. 80, yeah. To, to, like to add on to um, uh, what Ben is saying, from the very start of Brudy Frigo in 1997, one of the main questions uh, that was put at the center of the, the, the discussion was that this is a non profit, but it still has to become uh, uh, something that can sustain the people who work in it. It was not just based on giving you spare time. So there was the idea to invent an economical model around uh, uh, this cultural project. And uh, so as Sam was saying, there has always been a fluctuating number of people uh, in number or in, in people themselves. There's always been around four, five, six persons there on a permanent basis. And uh, probably three or four years ago, Brugge du Frigo uh, now has a secrétaire de direction, or I don't could call her, but uh, management is very important. Man management of uh, resources, of, of the money, and where it goes is very important. So people who can work in decent conditions, then you have maybe something to say about, seems to be a kind of democratical way of running the place. Yeah, yeah. maybe not. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually I see it more like... Um, association than a collective. It's not like... Uh, on, I think at the beginning it was a collective, but now it's uh, um, not the same, <laughs> I guess. But it has, it has a kind of... Uh, it's not a business, but it, it does have a structure. And uh, the hierarchy exists to a certain point, but it's very collaborative because that's in the, the essence of the projects itself. And you were talking about internships. Uh, you may correct me if I'm wrong, yeah, but uh, the discussions I had with uh, Yvon is that uh, there's always lots of people who, want, who are asking for internships, but the policy in Rue du Frigo is to pay the interns. Mm -hmm. So uh, that reduces the amount of interns uh, because when they come, they, there is a cost and an exchange of know-how. But there is a, a policy of uh, they give in work and energy, so they are paid even if it's the at least uh, what in France you're obliged to pay now around 510 euros or something for an internship of one month and that is paid. And, and with, the, with the size at five or six, has there ever been a temptation to uh, expand to take on a bigger project or has is, is, is that number just been always right throughout the, the kind of 18 years? Has that always kind of being made sense for the core or I think uh, we're growing re uh, slowly but uh, the, the aim is more to to stabilize uh, the structure than to, to expand yeah. yeah 
as Sam was saying, you have a core of people who are employed, you can say you can use that term, and then you have another core of people who either have other main employers or who are self-employed. Myself, I'm a professor at university and I work as an architect. Sam has his own uh, other uh, projects, uh, but we consider in different ways, I suppose, that we still belong to this uh, big house, which is Video. Yeah. <laughs> and there's always been, at the beginning of Video Frigo, there used to be a kind of procès uh, d'intention, you'd say in French, I don't know how you'd say that in English, but there was a very, lo lots of defiance from architectural firms in Bordeaux who were thinking that this was just a kind of triumph to uh, find a cheap way of doing architecture without having to pay what they would pay to the local authorities, but then they realized a few years later that we were working on fields that did not interest them, and then uh, things kind of settled. Are you in your studio right now? In your office? No, uh, none of us. No. It's uh, my room. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so you can give us a tour of your room. But... <laughs> I wouldn't ask for you. Uh, maybe I've been up before. <laughs> Um, okay, so our last question, actually, before we go into less formal questioning, is uh, time for storytelling. What is your proudest moment and your biggest failure? Maybe each of you wants to take one part of that question. Maybe Sam Someone goes first. <laughs> your biggest failure. <laughs> Coming out of the free. Start with the failure if you want. Yes. <laughs> no. No. Uh, can I start? Yeah, we're yeah. asking you. Yeah. So I think my my uh, biggest failure was um, the project uh, L'Institut du Point de Vue, when we try to open uh, to open uh, a space in a room, in the top of the roof of a building, and this was super difficult because it wasn't clear and uh, it wasn't a public space. So people from the building start to, not to fight, but to, to try to fight against this uh, project because they just said, no, it's my building, so I want to go and I need to go and uh, I'm here. So it was difficult because of security reasons. The thing was it, it was forbidden for uh, people uh, under 18. And then, of course, this... Uh, Teenager uh, start to fight against us to to say no. This is my place. Uh, I live here. This is my building. So I come. So this was a big fail because of violence. Actually, it was something that yeah and uh, misunderstanding. Oh, work in a real public space. And then I think my my best moment. Is uh, the last project in La Rochelle? Uh, we were in a in a shared garden with people on a, a teenager from fifteens, uh, I think. Uh, Florentin was there with us, and uh, we start to build together, and, and then he, he start to to like the the way of building on on working. And now he's writing me SMS and to Ben to ask for a lot of questions about tools, about how to do that, how to do that, how to create a project, how to connect with people. And this for me it's something super important because it's of course during the project and then is after the project. And I have some example like this that people uh, continue to connect and to, to make contact to in order to to know more or to continue to to act in this situation in this context or so this is super important I think yeah also you know, Ben you yeah, yeah. yeah actually uh, uh, you stole my my answers ah <laughs> the same <laughs> yeah for me uh, the same project institute de point de vue and uh, actually the whole project it's the one of the projects that was in the in la Benoge, in the quarter i was speaking before and uh, yeah uh, it, because of the security reasons we had like uh, a limited amount of people that could come on the rooftop and uh, uh, age limitation, so under 18 they couldn't come alone and uh, it led to a misunderstanding actually, so a lot of youngsters uh, were thinking we are doing a project 
in their quarter for the people from the city and uh, they told us like uh, yeah the the rich people from the city come in our quarter to visit the zoo and so it made like a tension and uh, uh, yeah I, I got like the feeling the, the project was turned around and uh, uh, didn't work quite in the, in the way we were thinking uh, or was mi misunderstood by some people and uh, it was a quite harsh moment and so also the finishing of this story where finally also the city uh, stopped the project so it was like uh, we were in between the city that uh, let us down and the, and some of the actually more the young people that didn't really understand the project and that uh, were thinking uh, we were, and didn't understand we were doing the project for them so this was uh, yeah, quite a hard moment I think and the uh, good moment is yeah actually uh, there are a lot uh, uh, as Sam says every time or uh, when we have somebody on the on the construction and we we've got the feeling it changed uh, the life of one person so uh, actually it's uh, often like uh, young people that uh, like Florentin he was speaking about who wasn't speaking a word at the beginning and at the end was uh, designing by himself, building by himself and uh, making jokes about us uh, and telling us we are not doing it the right way. This is a really nice moment. <laughs> no. He gets confidence and he found uh, something that's really pleasant to him and now Sam told me that he wants to make a project in his school and invite us in the yes. in his, to make a project in his school so this is really great, you know. It's, uh, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, me, uh, I'll start by the failure. <laughs> uh, it was a good project we did together. Um, we mixed the Rue du Frigo with, uh, on the side, I, I used to have my own practice as an architect. And together we had a joint venture in a, a dep socially uh, deprivated area in a city called Dax. Sam was with us there. And uh, the, I won't go into the details of the project, it was very interesting. We built another uh, Sam and, uh, then another person built this microarchitecture and something took place there for two weeks. It was very intense. Uh, it was a neighborhood where the, the, the local government had the impression they couldn't deal with the people, couldn't talk with them, and we realized we could. And uh, it created a very good synergy and the positive energies came out of this. And then they were kind of betrayed by the local politicians that just new elections came up and then they just turned their back completely on the whole process. So the whole thing, uh, like what Ben was saying about this uh, thing, the Institut du Point de Vue, generates frustration and uh, people have the impression that they have been uh, manipulated by us, which is absolutely not the case. But that's something that's very disagreeable and that you cannot really prevent because you, though you know it may happen, you have to take the chance. Uh, that was a mixed souvenir and maybe a good souvenir is an unfolding one. It's something not so much of a souvenir as halfway between. Um, uh, it's uh, that I'm beginning to implement uh, some of this way of thinking uh, into uh, schools of architecture uh, and getting some kind of liberty now to teach things around these processes and for me this is something that's very stimulating and uh, that I really look forward to developing so that for me is a success. I just have a follow-up question on that. Um, do you take time after these projects to debrief amongst yourselves and to talk about what went wrong and what went right and that kind of thing? Uh, sometimes we do, but uh, not enough, I guess. Yeah, because uh, often we have uh, a lot of projects coming one after the other, and uh, we try to, and uh, we find a moment, but often it's uh, later. It's not directly after the project. But uh, yeah, we have this time, uh, maybe not directly after the project, but uh, yeah. yeah. Because it's very intensive, so maybe some, some of the learning comes from experience when you're working on a new project. You know what worked and what failed, and you kind of add on, so it's a kind of uh, permanent construction. But I, was, I, I tend to have a kind of psychoanalytical sessions with Yvonne, who is the director of Rue du Frigo, and uh, 
uh, he said something once which I found is quite true. He said that it's not easy to, to, to be in the analysis and in the action at the same time. Uh, even I added to that, everyone his job, you know, uh, and so some of the discussions, because personally I have this will to bring this into theory and into teaching, into academia, so maybe on a very personal level uh, I do have these exchanges with, uh, I force the director to kind of talk about what he thinks failed or what he thinks was successful, so at this stage there is a trace uh, that is building up for the past three years at least of uh, feedback on some major projects, not all of them. Thank you. So I just look into the round. Um, Sam, Nick, is there anything you would like to add? Question? Yeah, uh, I, I had a, a quick one. Uh, I was just thinking about um, quite quite early on we were talking about the, the difference between um, the, the designing and then constructing, and um, the uh, the idea of the process in between, I suppose. Um, and it sounds like there's a very blurred line between um, the, uh, that it's not a kind of rigid um, let's design this and then let's implement it. And I, I wondered then, um, when you are on site, uh, kind of doing a project and constructing, is there a kind of on site? Um, office or on-site um, kind of place where you're also feeding back um, some of the things that you're learning from the people taking part or is it more a, a practical transfer of, of uh, things that you're picking up? Um, does, it, does it feed directly into the construction or is there a kind of uh, writing down and new sketches and, and so forth? Um, I guess that's the question. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure to get the question right. You mean uh, if we adapt the construction on site, uh, depending on what the people tell us, or if uh, from one project to the other? Um, so, so within the same project, um, this I, I just wondered, like uh, this this idea of it being inf the in informed process um, with the people you're working with. Is is there also a kind of space for? Um, you, you guys redesigning things and sitting down and re-sketching and maybe redrawing um, the, these frames that you you mentioned. Yes, and I, think I, I think that this uh, question is uh, just linked to the to, to the time that we have because of course time is always something super difficult to deal with. Mm. And, uh, most of the time is the <laughs> construction moment is short or have to be short, I don't know, it's something so now we try to say okay now we need more time and we need at least two or three days more because of course when inhabitants uh, to just to take part of the construction, it, just this take time so now we try to to adapt the moment and to say okay now people can work with us and it's something super important to have time. And this, of course, as you know, I think, Nick, it's always something difficult because when you have a deadline, it's difficult to change plan, it's difficult to draw new things, it's difficult to change materials. And this is always a, a deal. So, but the first uh, parameter is uh, the time, and this is always difficult, I think. Mm. Yeah, generally we have quite detailed plans and uh, there's al always a small part of improvisation and we have to adapt, but it's, uh, I think we could have even more, but yeah, as Sam says, it's, it's taking time and uh, I think it could be interesting to work more like this, but uh, right now we, we don't. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think there's... Um, the, the, all the previous work that is done on site for several months, networking, having workshops, talking with people. And as we said earlier, very often, I think two times out of three, uh, these or these uh, whatever spatial um, structure is built uh, are, I'm sure you're familiar with this word, third spaces. Uh, they are there for a certain period of time. And they are going to gather energies and uh, ideas and things like that. And they will serve the purpose of creating uh, what we call in French a programme, a programme, an urban programme or something. 
than who normally is supposed to go and feed uh, maybe other practices or uh, local governments. That's one side. Um, but if we go into another type of, of, uh, of process, which is uh, uh, implementing permanent structures, uh, reflecting what people uh, normally even what we do, uh, what is mainly done by uh, Yvon and, um, and Ben and, and people like Sam, uh, the, the whole design process is based on all this previous work that is done. But then sometimes, especially when you're in an architectural environment, people say, yes, but when you listen to people, you, you lose yourself as an architect and as a thinker and as a designer. And what we realize is that you don't. You just uh, have a bigger basis of influences and ideas that come into your project, but there is a process where you still use your training and your technicity to put things into shape. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm talking mostly from the perspective of these ephemeral structures, huh? because in yeah. the, 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 the field of works that have been done over the past 18 years, it's mostly things that were used as uh, vectors and not as uh, the, the architecture itself or the building or the design was not the, the, the final aim. It was a vector to go towards something else. Mm -hmm. I hope it answers your question. Yeah, yeah, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. I think we for now give a big thank you to these very intense and complex thank you very much. answers you gave. And for everybody who's interested this video and all the others, they you can see them on YouTube or you can get the link uh, through our website. So if you might want to go through this slowly again. And if there are no questions, I think we will just wave in the camera and say goodbye. Yeah, to just one well. minute. <laughs> thank, you thank you, everybody. Ciao. Bye. Yeah. Thanks. Hey. Hey. Go back to your fridge, Sam. Yes. <laughs> Bye. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Bye.